morning everyone thank you for all the trainee who have joined in the uh, international platforms to revise andrology with us today we have a trainee who has volunteered and also gave consent for recording which is very useful for further revisions and uh, to improve the presentation skills anish floor is yours good morning so today we are going to discuss the andrology and bps table so um, in the andrology and bps table uh, there are a lot of scenarios that can uh, be discussed in the andrology we will focus on the erectile dysfunction uh, uh, part of the andrology today so um, usually when you when, when you sit on the table the examiner will tell you like uh, so you are on the andrology table we are going to discuss a 54 year old gentleman preferred by the gp who, and he complains of erectile dysfunction how do you want to proceed from here so i'll ideally see this man in a dedicated erectile dysfunction clinic ideally with his partner um, and i'll take a first history and perform a physical examination um, in the history i will exclude this being um, ejaculatory or orgasmic dysfunction and i'll ask questions um determining if there's an organic cause for this patient's symptoms uh, these will include a gradual onset of ed uh, intact libido and ejaculatory function um and the loss of uh, spontaneous nocturnal and morning erections um i'll then um ask about risk factors in the past medical drug history for his ed um so just cardiovascular disease type 2 diabetes uh, any pelvic surgery or radiotherapy or endocrine disorders um and a lot about drugs that could be contributing to his ed um such as antihypertensives um cardiac drugs uh, antiepileptics and psychiatric medications um i'll establish his social history um to establish his uh, tobacco and alcohol use um and that of any uh, recreational and illicit drugs i'll perform a physical examination offering a male chaperone um in the clinic i'll measure the bmi and blood pressure um and examine the abdomen um and examine the external genitalia uh, looking for evidence of any peyronie's plaques um and testicular um presence uh, size location and consistency um and I'll perform a digital rectal examination uh, to exclude any signs of prostate malignancy um I'll then arrange further investigations depending on the clinical findings well done uh will you use any scoring system to assess his erectile dysfunction i'll you i'll gain an objective measure of these variety of symptoms using the uh, international index of erectile function 5 uh, scoring questionnaire um this scores from 0 to 25 the higher the score the less severe the erectile dysfunction um and this asks uh, according to the bouts website this asks about symptoms um occurring within the last 4 weeks um and it assesses um the patient's ability to sustain and maintain an erection uh, rigidity the ability to uh for the ability to penetrate um early collapse and overall uh, satisfaction uh, with sexual intercourse based on the erection all right so um what is the other name for iief 5 sorry iief 5 the other name mm. uh it's also called uh, shim scoring isn't it sexual uh health inventory for men right so what is the difference between iief and iief5 shim score um iief5 is limited to five questions um the shim score um has a much more extensive range of questions um it also asks um more extensively about satisfaction in more domains um such as uh, ejaculatory function orgasmic um function uh, libido um and overall satisfaction yeah so the initial one was i i e f 50 i i e f it was 15 items questionnaire it was very difficult in the daily clinical practice so that's why they came up with a 
the abridged version of the questionnaire which was validated so the new the uh, the new one the abridged version is called the IIEF5 or shame scoring and uh, yeah you are right all those uh, five domains asking and it asks for the, over the last six months and uh, what are the so you said that you will do some lab investigation based on the presentation and the um, other factors that we get from the history so in general what all lab investigations uh, will you do for a patient presenting with erectile dysfunction um, well, according to the nice guidelines the baseline investigations that i will arrange um, will be either a hba1c or a fasting blood glucose a fasting lipid profile um, an early morning fasting testosterone serum testosterone levels um, and a PSA if indicated, uh, depending on the history and um, DRE findings. Well done. Why are we doing early morning testosterone? What's the significance? Um, testosterone has a diurnal variation in terms of the peak in its serum concentration um, and its, uh, its highest levels um, in the early morning. All right, well, uh, so we will discuss more on testosterone when we discuss the late onset hypogonadism in another session. What are the risk factors of uh, developing erectile dysfunction? Um, so these risk factors include um, coexisting cardiovascular or peripheral vascular disease, um, poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, uh, previous uh, pelvic cancer and radiotherapy, um, and medications which include antihypertensives, uh, cardiac medications such as amiodarone and tolvastatin, uh, antiepileptics such as carbamazepine and phenytoin, um, and um, antidepressants um, such as tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, also include uh, underlying endocrine disorders uh, such as uh, hypogonadism um, and hyper or hypothyroidism. Uh, and uh, so rec and uh, drug use as well. Okay. Are you aware of any special testings for erectile dysfunction? Um, imaging can be used. Um, this is in the form of an ultrasound Doppler of the penis, uh, which can uh, detect whether there is an arteriogenic or vena occlusive cause of erectile dysfunction, depending on the peak systolic uh, velocity and the end diastolic velocity, respectively. Um, in order to determine whether uh, ED is psychogenic, there is also uh, the nocturnal and penile rigidity testing. Um, All right. Uh, what is the role for selective pudendal artery? Sorry, pudendal arteriography. Um, this will help to determine whether or not um, there is a significant arterial cause of erectile dysfunction, uh, and it can also allow for potential revascularization um, at the same time if discovered. Um, but um, yeah. I don't know the specific indications for it. Yeah, it's the, in the post-traumatic, especially in young patients with a history of pelvic or perineal trauma, when we suspect, as you said, if there is an arterial injury, then uh, before revascularization, we can do for we can go we can go for that arteriography. Yeah. So in general, what are the indications for this special test apart from the young patient with the history of pelvic and perineal trauma? Um because we won't do it in all patients, isn't it? We we do it only when there are specific indications. Yes. Um... So I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So one of the indication is primary ED or lifelong ED. So the patient hasn't had any erections at any point of time. So we have. We have so in those in those cases, we can do this special test. And also in persons with complex problems like psychiatric, psychosexual disorders, patients with endocrine problems, and sometimes at the request of the patient, and very rarely 
in cases of any medical legal reasons. Yeah. How would you define erectile dysfunction? Um, this is the inability to uh, sustain and maintain an erection. Um, which is um, insufficient um, for um, rigidity, um, insufficient for penetration, um, despite adequate um, sexual stimulation. Okay. Are you aware of any studies that has addressed the prevalence of erectile dysfunction in the community? Um, so I'm aware that um, erectile dysfunction um, the prevalence um, increases with age. Um, mm -hmm. So um, in men who are in their 70s, the prevalence is, so under the age of 40, it's less than 5%. Um, men in the age of 70s, it's 15%. And by the time of the 80s, um, prevalence increases to 30 to 40%. Okay. Uh, so... Uh two of those uh, main studies that are quoted to uh, when you when, when you ask about the prevalence is one is the MMAS which is the Massachusetts male aging study and also you can mention the Boston area community health survey which is which, but that is not uh, that much predominant like the MMAS study so in most of the literatures you will see this MMAS study uh, uh, that is relevant to say uh, to say, for the prevalence of the erectile dysfunction. Yeah. So our patient, so in, uh, he says that he has difficulty in maintaining the erection for the past one year, but it is getting worse for the past three months. He is hypertensive on Ramipril. His blood pressure is well controlled at 130 over 90. His BMI is very high at 35. So how are you going to manage this patient? Um, I'll first advise um, lifestyle um, changes. Um, mm -hmm. I'd advise him with regards to weight loss, um, modifying um, use of any drugs if he uh, smokes or takes alcohol. Um, I'll also ask if his GP um, could review his RAM because uh, ACE inhibitors um, have erectile dysfunction listed as a side effect. Um, and I'll encourage him um, to make um, lifestyle changes first, as uh, there are studies um, showing that uh, these can improve erectile dysfunction. Um, in terms of the follow-up and time frame, I will review him again um, in um, three months' time, um, but counsel him that if there is a little improvement in his symptoms, um, at this point, then you need to be started on uh, medications. I will also offer him um, starting on medications on pharmacological treatments at this time as well, but I'll uh, encourage uh, lifestyle measures first. Well done. So um, uh, he agrees to that. He went back, but he cannot... Uh, uh, um, I mean, his erectile dysfunction is not improving with the lifestyle changes. Uh, he comes back to you in three months' time. So uh, he hasn't tried any of the medications because he was reluctant to try those medications without being seen by a specialist. So he's in front of you now. He is a bit frustrated that things are not going ahead for him. So how are you going to counsel him further from here? Um, I'll counsel him about the use of um, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. Um, mm -hmm. I will um, start him first on sildenafil, um, as it can be gained, uh, sourced from over the counter, and it's got the lowest cost. Um, I will um, counsel him that he used to start at the lowest dose of so 50 milligrams, and this can be increased to 100 milligrams. And I would advise him that, uh, as per NICE guidelines, he needs to uh, try um, the maximum dose at least six to eight times um, before he switches to um, alternative treatments. Um, I'll also count him that he needs to leave at least an hour uh, between taking the medication and sexual activity, that he needs to ensure there's adequate sexual stimulation um, and to avoid uh, taking uh, this with a uh, fatty meal because this can reduce the absorption um, and the efficacy, um, and also ensure that he's not taking any cytochrome P450 inhibitors 
which could increase the bacteria concentration and likelihood of side effects. All right. Uh, what is the mechanism of action of PDE5 inhibitors? Um, PD5 is an enzyme which normally um, inhibits the hydrolysis of um, cyclic GMP into 5-GMP, uh, which then leads to detumescence. Um, so uh, in inhibiting that particular um, pathway, um, PD5 maintains uh, tumescence. All right. Um, what are the because we know that lots of, as you mentioned, the antihypertensives uh, cause erectile dysfunction. Are there any class of, any class of antihypertensives that can improve or we, that will not affect erectile, that will not cause any erectile dysfunction? Um, so these would be angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, calcium channel blockers, um, and loop diuretics. All right. So um, he is happy with your plan. You requested the GP to try to change his antihypertensive. You started him on sildenafil. What dose of sildenafil you start him on? 50 milligrams. Okay. And uh, if it is not responding to 50 milligram, even after six attempts? Uh, it can be increased to the maximum dose of 100 milligrams. All right. What is the success rate of PDE5 inhibitors as a class? Um, overall success rate is um, between 60 to 80 percent. Well done. Uh, what is the reason? I mean, uh, for patients who already had their cavernosal nerve damaged, like for example, Latin radical prostatectomy or any previous pelvic surgery. Are PDE5 inhibitors effective? Um, what's the reason that they are effective? Sorry, uh, what, what, what is the reason that they are less effective? Less effective. Um, it's because um, the um, pathway of action of PDE5 inhibitors uh, with regards to cyclic production of cyclic GMP um, refers, um, sorry, relies on the presence of. Um, parasympathetic nerve activity um, leading to the uh, release um, or activation of nitric oxide uh, synthase and subsequent liberation of nitric oxide. Um, so it depends upon um, the nerve pathways and um, autonomic nervous system um, for um, GT, for cyclic GMP to be produced. Well done. What are the, some of the contraindications uh, that are you aware of regarding the PDE5 inhibitors? Um, these contraindications include um, prescription of um, any nitrate medication, uh, a recent MI stroke or arrhythmia, um, history of unstable angina, um, blood pressure um, threshold. So if the systolic blood pressure is greater than 170 or less than 90, um, a non ischemic anterior. So non-arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuritis um, and severe renal hepatic failure. Well done. Um, and when you counsel the patient regarding the PDE5 inhibitors, adverse events, uh, can you tell me some of the adverse events? Um, main adverse events include um, headache, um, facial flushing, um, severe hypotension um, causing um, syncopal episodes. Um, Tadalafil uh, administration can also um, cause um, back pain um, and then you have to be take caution um, with some of the PD-5 inhibitors of alpha blockers because this can further um, reduce the blood pressure in synergy. All right. Um, are you aware of any visual disturbances when people use PD-5 inhibitors? Um, I'm not so worried about any person, you know. Yeah, so there is uh, something called as a blue vision uh, or sometimes uh, difficulty in uh, for, I mean, uh, accommodation when people use PDE5 inhibitors. Uh, and that is due to the cross reaction with uh, PDE6, phosphodiesterase, enzyme 6. Um, 
Okay. So, and you mentioned about the back pain or myalgia for tadalafil. Uh, what's the reason that tadalafil causes myalgia? Um, things is due to, I think it's due to PD-11, although I'm not, not entirely sure. Yeah, so uh, that was the uh, the previous literature uh, mentioned that it is PD-11, but later, the recent literature, if you go through EAU uh, as well, it, it shows that uh, uh, they exactly don't know what the mechanism is. One of the suggested mechanisms is because the PDE, uh, in PDE5 in PDE inhibitors, because they dilate the blood vessels, might be due to the venous pooling in the large skeletal muscles. So, so it's a bit controversy what's the exact mechanism of action. Is there any risk of priapism when uh, with PD-5 inhibitors use? Um, the overall risk is very small. Um, as long as they are used um, appropriately um, and not beyond the maximum dose, but the overall risk is, is very small, less than 1%. What is your advice uh, when someone asks you, when a patient takes a, for example, sildenafil and then he develops chest pain, can we give nitroglycerin or how long will you, will you, will you have to stop giving nit or prevent giving nitroglycerin? Um, I'd advise that uh, nitroglycerin would, is completely contraindicated, uh, any nitrate is completely complicated with um, co-administration of PD-5 inhibitors. Um, and I, if they do develop chest pain, then they need to be assessed urgently in their local um, emergency department. All right. And uh, there are recommendations saying that they have to, um, the, the nitroglycerin should be withheld for at least 24 hours if the patient has taken sildenafil and for at least 48 hours if he has taken tadalafil. Okay. Um, what about alpha blockers? If you are prescribing PDE5 inhibitor sildenafil to one of the patients, one of your patients, and on reviewing his medications, you can see that he is on alpha blockers. Is he at risk of developing hypotension, or can you co-prescribe PDE5 inhibitor with alpha blocker? Um, so for this particular patient, if he's on sildenafil, um, he's at risk of developing hypertension, uh, but he needs to wait at least four hours after taking his alpha blocker before he can take the sildenafil. Um, the, it, it differs by the uh, individual drug as well. So with sildenafil, uh, sildenafil is safe to take uh, with P alpha blockers. Sildenafil is completely contraindicated. Uh, and with avanafil, uh, the patient needs to be stabilized on alpha blockers first and um, before uh, they continue with PD-5 inhibitor. Well done. What about tadalafil and doxazosin? Are we allowed to combine or co-administer tadalafil and doxazosin? Um, I think caution so has to be taken. Yeah, so that is one of the uh, yeah, caution that we had to take because tadalafil is not recommended in patients taking doxazosin, but tadalafil and tamsulosin can be prescribed. Yeah. So moving moving on, he tried the 100 milligram tadal uh, sorry sildenafil for six times, no response. He he then tried Cialis, I mean sorry uh, tadalafil, uh, the maximum dose uh, for another six, six attempts because he wanted to avoid any other options, but unfortunately, this was also not helping. Um, what are his next options? Um, so this patient's next options will either be a um, vacuum erection device um, or our prosodil, which uh, could be administered either um, via intracavernosal injections, um, an intraurethral pellet in the form of muse, um, or as a topical cream to the glands, and this would be in the form of um, Vitaros. Okay. Um, can you tell me more about vacuum erection device? What is the mechanism of action? Um, so this um, um, induces an artificial erection through the creation of a negative pressure in the cylinder, um, pressure of uh, 90 millimeters mercury sufficient. 
the device itself consists of a cylinder a pump and rings uh, rings the rings are placed around the base of the penis um, and uh, the cylinder applied um, and an erection can be um, induced um, within two minutes um, it um, is recommended that the rings are removed no later than 30 minutes um, after the application um, and a vacuum erection device overall has high satisfaction rates. Um, the main side effects are that it can cause a pivot um, at the base um, of the penis because the proximal um, shaft tends to be more flaccid um, and there's also pain and bruising that can uh, develop with its use. Okay. What, what are some of the contraindications for the use of vacuum erection device? Um, so contraindications um, I think would involve, for example, if there's severe Peyronie's disease, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the concurrent use of pantocrydal and tantoplatelets is advised with caution, as it can cause mm -hmm. bruising, but it's not an absolute contraindication. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think yeah. any penile no, cancer... No, no, yeah, uh, even though it is not a contraindication, it might be really difficult for a patient with high BMI and buried penis. Yeah. And moving on to intraurethral pellet, uh, can you tell me more about intraurethral pellet? So this is a form of um, alprostadil um, with a dose of between uh, 500 to 1,000 micrograms. Um, it involves the delivery of a pellet into the urethra, which needs to be massaged throughout the shaft. Um, the um, expected time of onset of erection is um, up to 15 minutes, um, and the efficacy of this um, is approximately 66%. Um, well done. What is the me mechanism of action of alprostadil? Um, Alprostadil is um, another form of um, PGE1, uh, which together with vasoactive intestinal peptide um, acts to um, activate adenylate cyclase. Uh, this activates, um, this converts ATP into cyclic AMP, um, and this uh, stimulates protein kinase A, uh, which reduces intracellular calcium and leads to smooth muscle relaxation. Well done. Uh, what are some of the side effects of intraurethral pellet? Um, the main side effect of this is uh, penile and urethral pain in 33% uh, of the patients um, and also difficulty in uh, administrating this. All right. Um, are there any contraindications to the use of MUSE? Um, Presume um, neatal stenosis, um, known urethral stricture. Um, as relative mm -hmm. contrication would be persistent dysuria. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know any others. Yeah, and one, one thing that we know is because alprostadil PGE1, it can uh, potentially induce labor. So there is a warning though to avoid using during sexual activity if the female partner is pregnant. Right. And you mentioned, you also mentioned about topical application of alprostadil. Uh, what's the dose of that one? Uh, dose of this is uh, uh, 300 micrograms. Okay, well done. And uh, are, are there any adverse events that you describe for that? Um, the um, I suppose, again, it needs to be um, avoided if the partner is pregnant. Um, mm -hmm. it, um, there may be, I suppose, absorption through the skin or the mm -hmm. applying digits um, may not be appropriately um, applied. Um, its efficacy is less. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know any of the specific side effects. Uh, yeah, uh, what you said is right. What you, uh, and the, uh, all those side effects that you, you mentioned are right. And so uh, he 
was not particularly happy with the uh, Wacom erection device and uh, he doesn't want anything to be inserted into urethra. So he's, uh, uh, are you going to counsel him regarding any other options? Um, I'll counsel him again with regards to whether he um, is open to um, having intracavernosal injections. Um, but if he is not, then I'll inform him that um, further the only further management would be um, insertion of penile prosthesis. Okay. So uh, he thinks that he can give a try on the intracavernosal injection. So how, in your practice, how will you arrange for the intracavernosal injection administration? Um, I will um, arrange for the patients to be seen by um, one of the andrology nurse specialists within my unit. Um, and this will be to uh, go through the patients about the means of uh, administration um, to demonstrate the um, administration of the um, device, um, the appropriate doses, um, how often um, he can take the medication and what he needs to do um, after administering it. So in terms of massaging uh, the drug through the shaft and uh, waiting an appropriate time uh, for an erection. All right. How often we can use intracavernosal injection, uh, for example, in a week's time? Um, so within a week, um, so the maximum dose is once a day. Um, and in terms of within a week, it's a maximum of up to three times a week. Well done. And uh, what, is the, what, what is the type of intracavernosal injection that you use in your practice? Um, so in my practice, the commonly used one, most commonly used one is um, alprosidil um, or cabajet. Um, there is also an alternative one called Invicor, uh, which is a combination of phentolamine um, and um, vasoactive intestinal peptide. Um, but um, this is not routinely used in my practice. Okay. So what will be one of the indications that you prescribe Invicor instead of Cavalject? Um, so... Invicor has got a far lesser risk of priapism compared to Cavajet at 0.05% mm -hmm. compared to 0.35%. So if there is a patient with known sickle cell disease or is at high risk of priapism, then I'd consider Invicor. Um, I would also consider um, Invicor possibly if someone's got underlying Peyronie's disease because the risk of corporal fibrosis is a lot less. What about pain? The patient is com complaining of penile pain um, uh, on covered injection. Is it an indication for Invicor? Um, it would be because Invicor um, does not co cause uh, pain, um, whereas Cavajet, there's a 50% chance of pain. Okay. Uh, can you tell me uh, regarding some of the contraindications of intracavernosal injections? Um, so contraindications uh, involve uh, pre-existing um, anticoagulant antipoietic medications. Um, generally speaking, um, if a patient has known sickle cell disease or is at high risk of priapism, then that's a contraindication. Um, and again, if a patient has a reduced manual dexterity and is unable to administer the injection themselves or carers are unable to administer it, then this would be another contraindication. Okay. Um, what's the role, role of low intensity shockwave therapy uh, in erectile dysfunction? Um, as far as I'm aware, um, erectile, um, if it is an idiopathic erectile dysfunction, then ESW well does not have a role. Um, it um, did, used to be used um, for Peyronie's disease, where there was a Peyronie's plaque and it was thought to. Um, reduce the size of the plaque and cause PNL modeling, but the later evidence demonstrates that, uh, that it has no significant effect um, and is therefore not routinely used in practice anymore. Yeah, sorry. Uh, but still, the EAU guidelines recommend it may be offered for a vasculogenic ED. Indeed. Right. No. So uh, you mentioned that if the uh, Two of, two of the options that you recommend for that patient would be one, 
the ICI in the recovery of nasal injection, and the second option would be to counsel him on the penile processes. Uh, so, what are the types of penile processes that are available now? Um, so, you can get um, penile processes which has um, cylinders, um, so rigid and semi rigid and uh, malleable. Okay. Um, I would, uh, uh, that's an acceptable answer, but I would slightly three, change that. Three piece uh, and two piece as well. Yeah, so we can divide it into mainly inflatable and semi rigid, and inflatable into two piece and three piece, and yeah. semi rigid mainly into malleable. But nowadays, the soft flexible is also available, and the previous mechanical ones. Yeah. What's the advantage of three piece inflatable device? Um, so the three-piece device um, also contains a pump which can be deployed um, and sits within the scrotum, can be deployed by the patient um, to increase the size of rigidity, um, whereas the two-piece um, consists only of the two um, cylinders. Okay. So uh, what are the situations you prefer two piece or a three piece? Um, I think two piece would be um, contraindicated if the patients had um, previous, um, if they've had previous abdominal surgery, three piece mm -hmm. would be, sorry, two piece, three piece would be contraindicated. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. So, any other Exactly. So it, may, yeah, it might be a, a bit risk, risky to put the three. I mean, the reservoir blindly because when you use a three piece, there is a reservoir, and if there is any previous history of uh, abdominal surgery, uh, it can it can it can cause complications. So in those cases, you can use the two piece. And what's the advantage of using semi rigid processes? Um, so semi rigid processes can be. Um, kind of manually um, adapted by the patient um, in kind of certain situations where they may not want to have um, sexual intercourse, but they, for example, require um, an erection for kind of other purposes um, and workout-related activities. Okay. And what is the disadvantage of using a semi-rigid processes? Um, may not be able to... Um, you may not be able to achieve the rigidity as would um, be achieved, for example, with a um, inflatable prosthesis, um, and therefore mm -hmm. penetration um, would be um, reduced. Um, okay. All right. And what are the surgical approaches of uh, penile prosthesis implantation? Um, so the surgical approaches are um, either making a penis scrotal incision on the um, ventral aspect of the penis, um, or um, an incision can be made um, kind of at the base of the penis um, on the um, on the dorsal aspect um, for insertion. All right. Uh, what what are the advantages of a penis scrotal approach or an infrapubic one? Um, so the penis scrotal approach um, allows for um, I suppose easier access to the crease of the penis. Um, the incision is um, more concealed. Um, it's um, com compared to the infrapubic approach, there's less risk of um, peritoneal breach. Um, with the infrapubic approach. Um, there's, um, I suppose, great ease of incision and, and positioning, um, and also allows easier placements of the reservoir near the abdomen. Okay. And what is the uh, success rate of prosthesis implantation? Um, so in terms of overall satisfaction, uh, the success rate is very high. Um, for, from 80 to 90 percent. Um, in terms of um, complications, um, complication rates with regards to, for example, infection is approximately five percent. Okay. Uh, can you mention to me some of the complications of the 
penile implantation? Um, so penile prosthesis complications um, include um, poor satisfaction, um, migration of um, so during the dilatation, um, there could be crossover. Um, there may be perforation of the tunica albuginea or the urethra. Um, prosthesis erosion can occur um, and also prosthesis infection. So what are the precautions that you can take to avoid uh, prosthesis infection? Um, the precautions include um, prophylactic antibiotic um, at the time of surgery. Um, there are um, prostheses which um, come coated, um, either coated with antibiotics or um, antimicrobials specifically, although I can't remember the name. Um, and they can also come impregnated uh, with a coating which allows uh, the clinician to apply the antibiotic um, of their choice. Um, yeah, you don't have to uh, uh, mention the name, but you, you, yeah, there is something called as AMS inhibizone, yes. and uh, it's coated with the uh, antimicrobial. Um, and uh, this, this is one of the questions that uh, you can say about all the principles of processes uh, uh, to prevent the infection of the processes. You can answer it in the same way when you are asked about the testicular uh, process implantation. So think, yeah. uh, things like uh, strictly adhering uh, to the principles of surgery, avoiding prolonged wound exposure, minimizing the contact, using the no-touch technique, um, yeah. using only clippers and preparation with uh, alcohol chlorhexidine, yeah. in, in, dipping the implant in um, antibiotics. Uh, EAU says that vancomycin and gendamycin, but the center I worked, they use rifampicin. Right. And um, we can also uh, identify and pre-treat uh, the col nasal colonisa colonization of MRSA. We can yeah. treat that with the mupirocin and also extra precautions in, uh, in the persons with high risk, like the revision surgery or patients with impaired host defences like diabetes, immunosuppression, and especially when there is a penile corporal fibrosis, especially that can happen after priapism, these yeah. cases uh, are high risk. So uh, you, you, you can bring these points. Uh, and uh, you can also bring the points like the, uh, positive, the uh, po positive air pressure flow theatres, like in the yeah. orthopedic theatres. Um, suppose uh, if uh, a patient comes back, uh, if, uh, you, 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 you give a penile process uh, implantation. If he comes back with erythema, pain collection, which is suggestive of infection of the processes, uh, what will be your management? Um, so my management of this, once the diagnosis has been made, um, if there is suggestion of a collection, um, then um, I'll arrange for um, imaging of the penis. Um, and um, this would be in the form of an ultrasound scan to look for a collection. Um, however, ultimately, um, he will require surgery to both drain the collection, but also to remove the prosthesis um, because um, it is um, resistant um, to um, antibiotic administration. And therefore, the prosthesis will need to be removed as a whole um, with a time, um, gap time of at least three months before um, any reinsertion is, um, re is attempted. Okay. Um, if are you aware of any something called as a washout protocol? Um, can we yeah. uh, can we uh, remove the infected processes, give a good wash with the previous antibiotics that you have mentioned, and then can we put the new processes at the same time? Um, I was not I was not aware of this protocol. Um, so uh, recently it is mentioned that if you used a specific washout protocol, the salvage rate is almost more than 80%. Okay. Uh, well, well done. Uh, I enjoyed the session thoroughly. <laughs> uh, you have a very really, uh, good way of answering. You're controlled and you have all the keywords that are essential uh, uh, to answer in a viva. 
um, I enjoyed the session thoroughly. Thanks so much. And regarding, uh, I, I haven't given much of the feedback because I didn't want to interrupt the flow because you are yeah. doing it. With, you are doing it really well. But what, what I've done is I made all my questions in a, into a slide. That's what happens in the exam, isn't it? When you are in the exam, uh, you are the candidate, and the examiner has got a paper yeah. where all the questions and all the answers are given in those papers. Yeah. So one thing that you can do is once uh, uh, Mr. Tanishagar and publishes it in the YouTube, yeah. you know, we try to do it in a way where the slide goes along with the discussion. So you can that, always yes. compare. Yeah, so you can always compare your answer to what is, uh, 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 I mean, it's obvious that we cannot answer all, and we, we don't need to answer all the contraindications, but you can always compare uh, what needs to be uh, improved. In your case, it, is, it was really good, uh, but some of the things that you might need to answer more, those are given in those slides. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Very good, Puyish. That's a very dull nice presentation especially on a topic which is like a specialized topic and um, my only suggestion Piyush is uh, try to bring in some references somewhere um, as I said only for benign prostate and prostate cancer you need to really definitely show the evidences if not sometimes the examiners may ask but uh, yeah. even in andrology at least you can mention according to EAU 2021 somewhere so that it makes okay. your uh, talk like a like a evidence based uh, high level good talk and yeah. um, as uh, anish said thanks to anish uh, i will incorporate all the slides in the youtube so you can play pause and uh, revise the slides he has made uh, good slides on um, contraindications and shim score and also the various types of intracavernous injection agents comparisons pd5 pathway etc that will be a very yeah. good single point source of uh, revision also. And yeah. we both will work on it further to make it look better or with more literature or something so that next time when we are discussing anthology, the slides will be a little bit more revised. And it's a good learning process for us also indirectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Uh, during the preparation, <laughs> I'm enjoying all, doing all these things. And yes, definitely, each time our slides will improve. Thank you, Piyush. And uh, you have agreed to do your next session on Thursday. Uh, just message me what topic you want to do later once you decide. And okay. uh, otherwise, um, have a good Monday and wishing you a good working weekend to start. Thanks. Same to you both. Thank Bye. You.